Tonight, more communities under threat as crews struggle to contain wildfires spreading across Quebec. You could feel it in your throat, in your chest, so you had to keep outside activity uh, to a minimum. And in Nova Scotia, even as the rain falls, the fight continues to get a handle on the province's largest ever wildfire. From the twisted rubble in India, questions about how a deadly train crash could have happened. Plus, an iconic Canadian music producer takes me behind the console. I'm greedy for life. This is what was so great about him. He painted a picture. Bob Rock reflects on his legendary career and his collaboration with the late Gord Downey. This is The National with Ian Hennemansing. Growing concerns in Quebec tonight as new wildfires continue to ignite and the threat increases for nearby residents. Thousands more people have been forced from their homes this weekend. Others are being told to stay home and stay inside as smoke fills the air. There are now more than 150 fires burning in Quebec, far more than the province says it's able to actively fight. Reinforcements are arriving, but in two areas in particular, around the cities of Val d'Or and Set Hill, the wait is tense. As Quibina Oduro shows us, residents and firefighters are facing a fluid situation and a tough fight. Smoke is hanging over western Quebec. About half of the province's wildfires are in the Abitibi Temiskaming region, which borders Ontario. Its largest city, Val d'Or, is one of the most threatened areas. In nearby Lac Simon, residents are trying to find a place to shelter. Yesterday it was pretty quiet, he says, but all of a sudden it got out of hand. Then the whole village evacuated. Another major hotspot is the North Shore, where thousands of people, including some acute care hospital patients, have already been forced to flee. The city of Setil has extended its state of emergency for another five days. The mayor said he doesn't want people returning home, only to evacuate again. Some area residents say it's hard to breathe. You could tell that, you know, the, the particles in the air or whatever, and you could feel it in your, in your throat, in your chest. So, uh, you know, you had to keep outside activity uh, to a minimum. Uh, but, uh, you know, and you could see the smoke uh, quite visibly. Access to forests is being limited over fears new fires could be started. That will also make fighting those that are burning easier. Quebec's public security minister says resources are stretched thin, so efforts are being focused on the highest priorities. We want to protect our infrastructure like uh, Hydro-Quebec. We want to protect life. We want to protect houses. The province will be training auxiliary firefighters in the coming days. Members of the Canadian Armed Forces are already on the ground, with more firefighting resources to come. There's 100, 100 soldiers that will be formed today, uh, and they will be uh, able to, to fight these fires uh, with the sulfur uh, tonight and, or maybe tomorrow night. Everyone is watching the weather closely. Cooler temperatures and rain are in the forecast for the North Shore, but none is expected in the Abitib to Miskimeng region for several days. Kubino Duro, CBC News, Montreal. Nova Scotia's biggest wildfire on record is burning out of control tonight, covering about 250 square kilometers in the south. Reinforcements are on the way to help try to contain it, but in other parts of the province, that rainy weather has cooled down the threat. Sam Sampson begins her coverage in Halifax. This downpour, lifting spirits. The fires that threatened the Halifax region just days ago, now declared under control. Risk of spreading fire today is very low, but the fire's not out. We can't just leave. Neighborhood by neighborhood, officials are slowly letting people back in, as long as they can show their address at checkpoints. Still, thousands of people are forced from their homes. Smoldering hot spots are still a worry, and there are other things to consider before all residents can come back. We still have to look at water supplies. We still have to look at garbage. We still have to look at, are there is there damage in and around there? So even though from a fire perspective it may be safe, we also have to look at all the other concerns. Evacuee Aya Nakamoto and her cats are crashing at an Airbnb, but the booking will run out. If we're displaced for another two weeks, we're going to have to move around and just find somewhere else because so many places are just booked up. It would be nice to kind of have a timeline, but I understand that it's a very difficult situation. It's a hard thing to predict just with weather and wind and 
temperatures. Now that the Halifax fires are under control, more resources are coming here to the southern part of Nova Scotia, where the largest wildfire in the province's history has forced more than 6,700 people from their homes. People at this evacuation center in Barrington tell me they welcome this rain, but I can still smell smoke in the air. There is an air quality statement still in effect. Now all of this weather is helping put out that fire a little bit, but it actually grew over the weekend. This is something that nobody has seen in Nova, Nova Scotia. Though people in Barrington want to go home, Warden Eddie Nickerson says they have to respect the evacuation zone. It just sounded like a big freight train. That's how, that's how quick it can come up on you. And I don't think people are realizing that it can progress that fast. Sam, you're not far from that big fire that's still out of control. Tell us about the, the extra help that's coming in to fight it. Well, if any extra help does come, they're going to stay in these tents. Take a look at this. There are several of these in a baseball diamond in Shelburne, the town of Shelburne. And you can take a look. This is where all those hardworking firefighters are going to sleep. Now, right now, there are extra resources coming from other maritime provinces, uh, the United States and the Canadian Armed Forces. They're already here working on that out of control fire. But these tents are going to stay here for as long as needed, could be through the summer wildfire season. And if any extra resources do show up, this is where they're going to sleep. Glad you briefly got out of the rain, Sam. And another developing story tonight in Nova Scotia. The provincial government is revealing it's sorting through a breach of people's private data, but so far it says it doesn't know whose information has been taken. At this time, staff are manually going through all of the files that were accessed to identify what information was stolen and who it belongs to. We did not want to wait for all the answers before we told Nova Scotians what we are dealing with. The breach happened through a file transfer service called MoveIt, which informed the government on Thursday that its system was vulnerable. A security update has been installed, and the minister says people affected by the theft will be contacted directly. Now to a tense confrontation in the South China Sea and an aggressive maneuver by a Chinese warship towards a joint Canada-U.S. mission. Well, tonight, China is defending the move which happened near Taiwan. Katie Simpson shows us the incident being considered a dangerous provocation. You're about to see a dangerously close call on the Taiwan Strait. Video, courtesy of Global News, shows a Chinese warship, the one on the left, headed toward the path of an American destroyer. The U.S. ship slows down just in time, narrowly avoiding a collision. At one point, the vessels were only 137 meters apart, less than the length of two football fields. That is a really dangerous thing to do. I mean, we're talking a very short distance. Uh, something could go terribly wrong. The American destroyer had been on a routine patrol of international waters alongside a Canadian frigate, HMCS Montreal, when the incident happened, and follows another close call about a week earlier. A Chinese fighter jet performing an aggressive maneuver in international airspace above the South China Sea. All of it underscoring the escalating tensions in the region. A key topic at this weekend's high-profile defense summit in Singapore. Conflict in the Taiwan Strait would be devastating. The U.S. called China's actions irresponsible, urging decision makers to rein it in. Canada echoing the message. Well, I hope that the feedback is taken seriously. But Beijing pointed a finger back at Washington, claiming the Americans are in spaces they have no right to be, accusing the U.S. of provocative actions. It is undeniable that a severe conflict or confrontation between China and the U.S. will be an unbearable disaster for the world. Efforts to reset the China-U.S. relationship don't appear to be working. A top U.S. national security advisor says at some point, President Biden will meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping. But there's no timeline and no public plan. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. The sonic boom of fighter jets rattled people in Washington this afternoon.
That's the sound of F-16 scrambled after a small plane flew over the capital. It had taken off from Elizabethton, Tennessee, up to Long Island, and then without explanation was turned around and flew straight back over Washington. It crashed near Montebello, Virginia. U.S. officials say the jets didn't cause the crash. No official word who was on board. There are more questions and anger tonight about the safety of India's rail system in the aftermath of that horrific train crash. Since Friday, authorities have been scrambling to find survivors and identify the dead. As Salima Shivji tells us, officials are now pointing to what they say could be the cause. The toppled sleeper cars have been pushed off the tracks, workers rushing to clear debris and crushed metal. The grim aftermath of one of India's deadliest train accidents swept away. In the chaos of those first frantic hours scrambling to save hundreds of injured, officials got the death toll wrong. So finally they found that few dead bodies uh, have been uh, reported uh, twice, double count. So uh, after uh, weeding out those uh, duplicates, death uh, total is 275, 275, not 288. The numbers mean little to those searching for their loved ones at makeshift morgues with melting ice. Seema Chowdhury clutches her husband's photograph in despair. I've looked everywhere, she says. I just need my husband. I don't want anything else. Most of the victims have not yet been identified. <laughs> My husband hasn't been found, Kanchan cries, her raw pain impossible to contain. All she knows is he was lost in a mass of mangled metal. The disaster has renewed questions over the safety of India's railways. It transports more than 13 million passengers every day, a vast network plagued by aging tracks, despite the government investing billions on upgrades. As India's railway minister toured the wreck site, he blamed the crash on a possible signal failure. Electronic interlocking ki baat hai. It was an error in electronic signals that sent one of the passenger trains onto the wrong tracks, he says, where it smashed into a stopped freight train before another passenger train hit both at high speed a fraction of a second later. But for those burying their loved ones, the question as they grieve is how the signaling error could have happened and why. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Mumbai. Police in Quebec have found the body of the last remaining missing person from a fishing group that was overwhelmed by the rising tide of the St. Lawrence River. The bodies of four children were found yesterday. And as Georgie Smythe shows us, residents in the area are in a state of shock and sorrow. In the waters of the St. Lawrence, police now confirm five lives lost to a rising tide. Four children, two of whom died alongside their father, identified as 37-year-old Kevin Girard, found Sunday. They were among a group of 11 catching Kaplan fish on the shore in Pont of Samur, a popular activity where people fish on the riverbank using nets and buckets, often waiting for when the fish come ashore at night. The tide began rising Friday night while the group was out. It climbed by four metres between 8pm and 2am when the waters peaked and six other members of the group were rescued. The town's mayor says most people from the area know about the river's large tides. The group was from the nearby towns of Tadoussac and Les Escumaines small communities where the family were well known and the children, all above the age of 10, went to school. A vigil today brought people together to grieve and remember. This woman says she lived close to some of the victims and their deaths are an immense loss. I bawled my eyes out. Half a family is gone, says another. Local officials say they haven't heard of anything like this happening before. The sudden loss of five people is likely to leave some more wary of the waters for years to come. Georgie Smythe, CBC News, Vancouver. Now to the war in Ukraine and calls for Canada to do more to help. In an exclusive interview with CBC's Rosemary Barton, 
Poland's prime minister called for further military cooperation. As J.P. Tasker tells us, it's a request Canada appears to be considering. In Dnipro, the signs of an unrelenting war. A Russian missile attack leveled parts of this eastern Ukrainian city. First responders scrambled to save the victims. War-weary residents are traumatized. <laughs> Suddenly the fridge fell onto me. It hit me on my lower back. I was watching how everything collapsed. Among the victims, a two-year-old girl. Ukraine's vice prime minister delivered the grim news. <laughs> the father came home to find his daughter. He dragged her from beneath the rubble with his bare hands. These grisly scenes come as Ukrainian troops prepare to launch a counteroffensive. Soldiers trained by Canada and other NATO allies will lead the charge. We're waiting for the orders. The moment they come, we'll attack, says this officer on the front line. How are you? Nice to see you. At a summit in Asia this weekend, Canada's defence minister met with her Ukrainian counterpart. We were so pleased to join the tank coalition and deliver eight tanks. In an exclusive interview with CBC's Rosemary Barton Live, the Polish prime minister said he wants more from Canada as the war intensifies. I'd advise uh, everyone to spend even more because security, stability is the backbone and foundation of any prosperity and any long-term development. Canada has already committed some $8 billion in assistance to Ukraine. After meeting with Poland's leader, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau signaled there may be more on offer. We continue to stand as two of the strongest voices around the NATO table. NATO leaders will meet next month in Lithuania. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is lobbying for membership in the military alliance. While Canada is on board, it's still seen as a long-shot bid. What's more likely is a security guarantee, something the country needs as it prepares to strike back against Russia. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. This is the 34th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre when China launched a deadly crackdown on pro-democracy protesters. Vigils were held around the world today, including in Canada. But eyes were on Hong Kong's Victoria Park, where the freedom to commemorate Tiananmen was once an indicator of democracy. This year, it hosted a food festival, marking the territory's handover to China instead. <laughs> Nearby, police arrested dozens of people, including several well-known activists, for holding symbols of the massacre. In 1989, the crackdown in Beijing's Tiananmen Square killed hundreds, some say thousands, of pro-democracy protesters. In China, information related to the incident, including internet searches, is suppressed. And there is concern tonight about allegations of China's meddling in Canada's elections, prompting calls for change around the riding nomination process for federal candidates. Some say the current rules leave the process vulnerable to exploitation. Olivia Stefanovic on the demands for greater oversight. Deb Tate says running in a riding nomination race was like playing a game with no rules. I was concerned right from the get-go that the whole thing had been fixed. Tate says she didn't receive the membership list in a timely fashion and worries the party didn't thoroughly check voter IDs. I think if Elections Canada had some oversight, all of those have to be followed. The Conservatives told CBC News the nomination process was fair and in accordance with its rules. Meanwhile, concerns over the contests are at the centre of another controversy. This foreign influence is growing. David Johnston found Beijing may have taken advantage of the lax rules <laughs> in Han Dong's 2019 Liberal nomination. Though Dong himself says he's unaware of the irregularities. These nomination processes can be extremely murky. The Green Party is calling for more oversight from Elections Canada. It would be important in the context of recent allegations of foreign meddling that there be uh, additional measures in place. It's going to allow another level of scrutiny and another level of equilibrium. Sheila Copps says Elections Canada should take over nomination appeals. The longtime Liberal MP lost a nomination contest in 2004, tainted by allegations of dirty tricks. I was basically told by my lawyer that if I did pursue it, you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. You have to agree to pay all the lawyers involved if you lose. 
This political scientist worries Elections Canada stepping in would infringe on a party's right to choose candidates how they wish. In democracies, the idea is, of course, that individuals and actors like parties are, are, are free. Elections Canada says the chief electoral officer will consult federal parties about the nomination process this fall. The decision to make any changes rests with Parliament. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. The Denver Nuggets could become this year's NBA champions, thanks in part to their young Canadian star. Murray again. 15 for Murray over the first half. We head to the Ontario city celebrating Jamal Murray's success. We're all so proud of you. Good luck, dude. The Canadian behind Metallica's seminal album reflects on his experience. They were very opinionated, and it was really hard to do the record. And a New Brunswick man reaches the highest peak on earth. I was 48, 49 when I started really climbing. We're back in two. Swedish soccer great Zlatan Ibrahimovic serenaded tonight by fans in Milan after he announced his retirement. The 41-year-old is considered one of the greatest strikers of all time, scoring 62 goals for Sweden. He also has 13 league titles in four different countries. Major League Soccer fans will likely remember this stunning goal back in 2018, Zlatan's first league goal for the LA Galaxy. Canadian basketball star Jamal Murray playing tonight in Game 2 of the NBA Finals in Denver. Murray's looking to help deliver the Denver Nuggets their first ever NBA championship. And if he does that, he joins an elite list. Only eight other Canadian players have ever won an NBA title. Murray's play has excited fans all season, but it's in Kitchener, Ontario, where he's likely most adored. As Travis Danrath shows us, the hometown hero's playoff run has captivated the city. From the pub. We're all so proud of you. Good luck, dude. To the streets. And the court where he once shot hoops. Yeah, yeah go, go Murray! Murray. Woo! The kid from Kitchener seems to be the only thing on this city's mind right now. I'm so proud to be from Kitchener, my hometown. Like, I'm so impressed. It's a crazy feeling. It's so good. He's on the main stage and he's killing it and uh, definitely makes me really proud. Jokic to Murray. Murray, good luck for three. Puts it in. 26-year-old NBA superstar Jamal Murray has been called a prodigy. He started playing at just three. By 12, he was taking on high school and college players. When I first met him, he was kind of making me reimagine what's possible. During his formative years at Orangeville Hoops Academy, Murray opted to do something most teenagers would dread, give up his phone to focus on the game. He came in with such a, a dedication and tenacity that I had never seen before. The Denver Nuggets select Jamal Murray. In 2016, the big leagues came calling. He's got a little bit of that Kobe DNA, and it's, um, so it's a little bit surprising that he's elevated like this only because the light, the spotlight has been in other places. Despite the meteoric rise, the fame, the accolades, home is never far from mind. Just excited for that town. Um, be back there in the summer, see all my friends, see my friends uh, and family. Whatever the outcome of the NBA championship, here in Kitchener, Murray will remain king, an inspiration to so many to never give up and dream big. Travis Danrash, CBC News, Kitchener. One take, Travis, was that one take? One of Canada's legendary music producers releases a truly personal album. We held hands between our bikes. Bob Rock tells me what it was like to make music with Gord Downey yeah, kind of one last time. After he passed away, I really couldn't look at this. I couldn't listen to it. And a Quebec mining community is facing a growing issue. Do you think that there's a racism problem? Yes. What's behind the troubling trend? The National takes you deeper into the stories shaping our world next. So 
this is a cool space. It's called The Warehouse, owned by Brian Adams, one of the iconic recording studios in Vancouver. And we're here to talk to one of the iconic record producers from the city, Bob Rock. But first, a look at his career in 30 seconds. After a string of Canadian hits with the Paolas in the early 1980s, Winnipeg-born Bob Rock found his greatest success behind the console. As an engineer, he worked the soundboard for some classic 80s albums. And as a producer, he helped create top-selling records by The Cult, Motley Crue, and Metallica. Rock's most recent release is a collaboration with Gord Downey. The two friends had been working on songs together on and off before Downey passed away in 2017. It's an album years in the making and very close to rock. Bob Rock, it's such a pleasure to, to sit down with you. Thanks for doing this. My pleasure. It's great to meet you. Oh. You're quite famous here yeah. in Canada. Yeah, like barely, but that's okay. Let's, um, let's talk about Lester Parfait and sure. work with Gord Downey. How, how did that project come about? I had done two Tragically Hip albums, World Container, and We Are the Same. I had a great experience with them, but Gord and I just became friends uh, and talk, talked about our families, being Canadian, loving hockey, music and stuff. So at the end of uh, the project of We Are the Same, uh, he said, do you have any music that I could maybe write some lyrics to? And uh, so I started sending him tracks. So I sent, sent a couple to him um, and he sent something back and it was amazing. It was like I was floored, to be quite honest. Adam, your engineer, is here, and uh, we're going to listen to uh, one of the tracks yeah. on that album. You, you chose North Shore. Why? I think that was the first one that I sent him. It was fully realized, and he sent it back. So Adam fired up. This would have been kind of what Gord would have written about. You know, he would have gotten that and started writing the lyrics to that. That n nothing fancy, just the basic song structure. We by like angels, with our heads held so high, and eyes heavenward. We don't care. We held hands between our bodies. You were saying you don't usually listen to his vocal isolated, so as you listen to it now, what were you thinking? Well, what I hear is all the beautiful nuances that, that he brought to the vocal, the performance. But just to, uh, as a note, one line that sticks out to me is we held a hand between our bikes. You know, that, and this is what was the, so great about him, he painted a picture. Like, it's, I can see the North Shore when you hear the whole song. You know where it is. No matter where it is, I'm just saying you see the picture of what's happening. It's a man and a woman that connect. What's the process been like over the last few years? After he passed away, I really couldn't look at this. I couldn't listen to it. And, um, but someone became interested and maybe wanted to hear it. And uh, Arts and Crafts, the label. And uh, so finally I took a look at it again and I finished it. And when he passed away, and at the last time I talked to him, he said, make sure everybody hears this. So I had to, I had to do it. I have done such bad work. I'm greedy for life. Now, I feel like I'm in a winery talking to an expert, and I'm not, and then I say something about wine. When I listened to Lester Parfait, I, I was thinking David Bowie. Like, I don't know, like it just sounded kind of like, like Bowie. But you, I'm getting nothing from you, so I guess I'm alone in this. No, you're not alone. Uh, I mean, uh, Bowie and Mick Ronson in particular, his guitar player, was a huge influence. He produced two of the Paolo's albums, and we became very close friends. So the, there's a lot of uh, Bowie, the Stones, Lester Parfait, there's a, definitely a Stones feel. Mm. Uh, ho there's horns on there, which is strange. But um, 
Yeah, like I said, all the influences. That, that's why the album is so eclectic in mm -hmm. terms of all the different uh, songs. So let's talk about the payolas for a moment. And, and for me, my age, I, I was on the East Coast buying a lot of records, working at a radio station, and uh, I love Eyes of a Stranger. I mean, 40, it's been 40 years. 40 years later, I can, it's one of those songs. Really? That, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah. I, I can still listen to that song, though, and it, and it, it doesn't sound, it, I, I just, I still, I love it. Uh, I, a quick story, the song came from a uh, Bob Marley album, Natty Dread, and I noticed that they were playing along to a drum machine. So I ended up finding that drum machine, and I was fiddling with it, and uh, I recorded a demo uh, at Little Mountain when I finished the commercial, I think it was Hudson's Bay. We had a bit of tape, so I recorded that with the assistant engineer, the drummer that played on it. And so the whole track was pretty much done. And when Mick Ronson came to hear our demo, uh, all our demos, he said that, you know, I think we can't get better than that, which is really surprising. Most producers would want to re-record it and put their stamp on it. He just heard that it was great as it is. So it's, it's really just a demo. So as a producer, you've worked on a lot of big albums, uh, including what turned out to be Metallica's greatest selling album. T tell me about that. You know, when you make a record, you, you really don't know how it's going to turn out. I think what made it different for me is that they were very opinionated and it was really hard to do the record, but they challenged me and I challenged them. And I think we ended up that it wasn't all just happy. We were not fighting, but there was just that, that edge to the whole project. And that ended up being something special. And the thing about the Metallica, that Metallica album in particular, was um, James started singing rather than yelling. And he was, I think it's his most personal lyric, any record he's made. And you guys became like not only colleagues, but friends, right? Eventually, it took a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it took a while. I had to prove myself constantly in that album. Did it sound like Metallica? No, it didn't. It didn't even sound close. The guitars aren't loud enough. I'll let you guys duke it out on this one. I'm tired of arguing. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you're not tired of arguing. <laughs> when I walked in here today, it, it was everything I hoped it would be in terms of the way it looks. And it just it seems like an exciting place to be. And I think in the history of, of music, you hear about people talk about Muscle Shoals or Honky Chateau or, you know, just, just how, how records sometimes reflect the sound of the studio they came from. But oh, now, yeah. now we live in this era where, you know, Billie Eilish can put together beautiful records that, from what I understand, she just does at home. I love that! What do you think of that trend, the fact that people can just, you know, not have to come into a room like this and put out a song. I just believe music, wherever it comes from, you know, it can be live drummer, it can be a drum machine, I've used that, but the point being is that whatever you gotta do to make a record, just do it. Uh, whatever inspiration you draw from, that's, it's, it's about inspiration, hard work, and just doing what you do. So she can record it in a living room because that works for her, she makes a great record that way. Not everybody should do that, but it works for her. And so, you know, Metallica is similar to a lot of the records that you worked on, kind of a certain style. Yeah. Um, but a little bit of Bob Rock trivia, and not a trivial point, uh, the two biggest selling albums you worked on are, as I said, Metallica, that won't surprise anybody, but the other one? Michael, Michael Bublé. Bublé's, well, the Christmas album. Yeah. But I've done, worked on four albums with Michael. So that's, what's up with that, Bob? Well, what the, that is, is the love of making records. Like I said, it's... I liked all kinds of records. I, people say, what kind of music do you like? I just say good music. You're very much still in the creative stage of, of your career. I get that. You're still very active. You clearly love what you're doing. Uh, but what, what do you hope your legacy is in music? I don't know. I just never really thought about it. I just, you know, it'd be great if somebody liked the records that I made. I'm fine with that. 
That's it. It sounds like a good legacy. Yeah, you know, they, I, I'm really blessed that I've made a living, support my family, and I make music. I mean, I couldn't have asked for a better life, to be quite honest. Well, you are widely regarded as one of the best at what you do, and it really has been very cool to sit down and chat with you a little bit. Thank you very it's much. It's been a pleasure. So how does a Canadian kid end up sitting where he's sitting there? He got into the business by responding to an ad that he heard on a Vancouver rock radio station to learn about a recording studio. And the rest, as they say, is history. Next, a Quebec community concerned about petty crime is now facing another problem. Get out of here, says I don't give a F about you. How the city plans to tackle growing racial tensions. Next. The city of Val d'Or, Quebec is struggling with homelessness, racism, and petty crime as an indigenous community pushes for change. This is the reality for many towns across Canada when systemic discrimination can seem to put those problems on an endless loop. Sarah Levitt shows us how it leads to intolerance. A council meeting turned into shouting match. I want to be able to walk on 3rd Avenue with my grandkids, this man says. Vitriol in Val d'Or, 500 kilometers north of Montreal, a city grappling with outrage from residents over homelessness and petty crime. Heightened after the mayor made a public appeal for help from the Quebec government. For some, though, those issues are hiding another greater one. Have you experienced racism here? I did, uh, with, uh, I don't want to be a racial discriminative uh, person, you know. I'm, I treat everybody equally, but uh, as a person that was living on the streets, uh, I experienced that there, which is uh, not too good at all. You know, I could not even go at that third avenue there. Victor Tusky, originally from the Algonquin Reserve Rapid Lake. His battle with alcohol landed him on the streets of Val d'Or. Victor's the kind of person residents are angry at, homeless and indigenous, the target of prejudice. Get out of here, says I don't give a F about you, native, that's what he told me. Val d'Or once again at a boiling point. In 2015, the city was thrust into the spotlight after a TV report detailed allegations of abuse, including sexual assault of Indigenous women at the hands of provincial police officers. A commission looking at how Indigenous people are treated in Quebec found they face widespread systemic discrimination. A problem still present in Val d'Or, where half of the homeless population are Indigenous people. So, want to show me around? Absolutely. Uh -huh. So this is the front, uh, front desk. This is the epicenter, actually, of the Piole. Since 1983, La Piole Homeless Center has been a place for people to gather, sleep, and get a bite to eat. Anna Dagenet is one of the social workers there to greet them. Do you think that there's a racism problem? I think so. In Valor? Absolutely. It's educating the white people. You think that's lacking? Yes. There's a, there's a lack of open-mindedness about this. It hurts me. I'm a white gal there, but it hurts me deep, really, because they are human beings that need help. Bottom line. If the mayor's plea for help raised tensions, the member of the provincial legislature, the MNA, caused outrage. Here's Pierre Dufour at the local council meeting. He says the reports about police officers abusing Indigenous women were full of lies. He's apologized amid calls for him to step down. The impact of his comments, though, still sting for many. That includes Edith Cloutier, head of the town's Native Friendship Centre for the past three decades. An MNA that speaks out publicly in a municipal meeting in that manner is 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 not representative of of what uh, an MNA should be doing. He's sort of stoking the fire, stoking the fire, and clearly taking position for a a portion of the people that he's he has the privilege to represent 
at the National Assembly. So we feel that we were left down, and I say we because we are Indigenous people in this Friendship Center. We walk side by side by those who are left out in the society, be it homeless people or be it Indigenous women. If 3rd Avenue is the hub of Val d'Or, the Native Friendship Center is the heart. For almost 50 years, it's been essential in ensuring any Indigenous person passing through or staying in Val d'Or gets the services they need. A key place, the city says, in helping deal with this latest controversy. We feel it's very unfortunate uh, what happened in our city hall. Céline Brindamore has been mayor of Val d'Or for the last year and a half. How can work be done if you're asking the provincial government for help and the provincial government representative is saying you're not doing enough, how do you guys make it work together? This is something that uh, we've never seen coming. The fact that all that delinquency is taking over the sadness of people having to live on the street and that the, the people are, are not tolerant anymore, it's a big, big concern and we're trying to work on that. There's a uh medicine pouch and uh, so it's for uh, good luck. Something Victor says he needs. And people misjudge me there, you know, and I know what it is there to be misjudged. I feel like I was belittled, you know. What my motto is sometimes, uh, I be good to people, you know, you always come back. Sarah, with all that's happening in the city, what steps are being taken to, to move forward and try to improve things? Well, Ian, there is a, a number of concrete actions being taken, most as a result of that commission in 2019 on systemic discrimination. Specifically in Val d'Or, though, they're about to break ground on a brand new center for transi transitional housing. And uh, the Native Friendship Center is also expanding. So for those at the heart of these changes, they do say that they have seen more input from the federal and provincial governments, something they say is essential if real improvement is to come. All right, Sarah, thank you. Thank you. This Wednesday, the Bank of Canada will make its next interest rate announcement. And while economists don't expect a rate hike this week, many predict one could come this summer. That's because new data shows the Canadian economy is still growing, not slowing down like the central bank says it needs to in order to drop inflation to its target level. Interest rates are one factor pushing up the cost of housing. Another for renters is supply. Some homeowners are opting to rent out their spaces through companies like Airbnb, and, and that adds pressure to the overall market. Adrian recently sat down with Airbnb hosts and renters to talk about the challenges of being a landlord and of finding a place to live. You're profiting off of this housing. It's a business. Businesses have risks associated with them. Yeah, um, but, but going personally bankrupt because of the minority of tenants is unacceptable in anyone's eyes. You Imagine. went personally bankrupt? No, I'm saying if I didn't have the means to cover the mortgage, guess what? Mm -hmm. Mortgage goes default, gets on your bureau, you have to declare bankruptcy. So that minority, that one tenant, can ruin your life for, for good mm -hmm. but I guess in my, Canada. My point is that um, that hasn't happened to you yet. And it probably won't happen to you. And I don't think that it's because you're using Airbnb. It's because, generally speaking, you're in a profitable business model, regardless as being a landlord is a profitable endeavor and you're going to be just fine. You can catch the full discussion between renters and Airbnb hosts tomorrow night on The National. Next, a New Brunswick man reaches the top of the world. It was just spectacular to see the curvature of the earth his journey up Mount Everest is our moment. A proud moment for New Brunswick's Rick Irvin, flying the provincial flag atop the world's highest peak. Irvin started climbing just over 10 years ago. Now, 60, he never imagined he would tackle Mount Everest. His extraordinary feat is our moment. A mountain climber later in life, definitely, I was 48, 49 when I started really climbing. In fact, two years ago, my first, my first attempt at Everest, I didn't make the summit. So this year, let me tell you, you know, I'm feeling really good, but it's in my head. Am I going to do this? It was just spectacular to see the curvature of the earth. 
is something that everyone should see. You know, it's just like really, it's really something that uh, brings tears to my eyes almost to talk about it. It was just, just a magical day. Again, it was worth it, you know, to come back. Maybe, you know, I can hit home with a couple of kids that, that look and say, yeah, this guy's um, pretty normal. <laughs> you know, how did he get to the top of the world? And, you know, it wasn't easy. It was uh, really a five-year push for me. But I think if there is a message, it's try something that's out of your comfort zone and see where your limits are, right? Look, by any measure, it is an extraordinary achievement and, and a big challenge. We had a reminder here in Canada not long ago when a, a climber died uh, on Everest of the dangers involved. But, the, you know, he certainly took it seriously. He did two hours of exercise, hard exercise every day on an empty stomach, slept in an, a tent with only 10% oxygen, and clearly was uh, ready for the climb. That is The National for June 4. Thanks for being with us. Good night.